in the future. The great thing about the brain, even though that's a very hard thing to reverse, it's a plastic brain. So even if it's only accidentally for, for one occasion, a person, even without planning, doesn't avoid. They go through the fear and they come out the other side and they go, oh, wow, I'm okay. That experience alone is enough to start to change the brain. But yes, you're right. Every time that behavior is repeated, it reinforces the behavior for future situations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. It sounds like you're saying rightly that when we, when we go through it, we validate through some logic thing that, oh, yes, I, I lucky I avoided that, so now I'm safe. So we validate that fear but as that just continues to grow more and more. Yes. 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 Mike, do you want to do that, Danny? Yeah, you're right. CBT does involve behaviours and changing behaviours. The CBT, though, would say if you change your thoughts, your behaviours will naturally follow. It's not always the, the case with anxiety. Behaviour therapy says we'll just try to change behaviour and the thoughts and feelings will take care of themselves. Good, thank you. Any any other comments? Any other queries? Anything from chat? Yeah, yes, yes, we do have um, <laughs> a question on chat, and it's this: How do we support the other children in a family with the ripple when one child has anxiety um, in brackets, GAD, social phobia, and panic agoraphobia? Yeah, the challenge is there. Thank you for your question. Uh, with great difficulty. <laughs> Um, trying to find a balance, a, a, a sort of, a, a, again, a holistic way of caring for the family when one or two in the family have special needs it does require a lot of patience and care, sensitivity. We need each of the children to know that they are loved and, and cared for and treasured. The risk, of course, is when we focus heavily on one of the children because of that mental health issue, the rest of the children can feel somewhat alienated. And I think it's taking a concerted way of saying, am I are we as parents letting the other kids know that they are loved and treasured and cared for while we continue to, to nurture in a special way this particular child or children that have these issues? Danny, would you add to that at all? Not a lot, Traff. I think it's that balance, isn't it? And as a parent, you're always multitasking and you're always trying to uh, address the needs of all your children. When there is anxiety or other concerns it becomes even more complicated so trying to support the child that does have those challenges and as you say look, look after the kids is a real juggling act look after the other children I think though that acknowledging the reality of each member of the family acknowledging the rea reality of the child that has anxiety how tough it is for them and having conversations about how we function and cope as a family, what our resiliences are, what we do when things go sideways or when the anxiety takes over, so that we're working together corporately, even though they are challenging circumstances. And I guess that sometimes might mean, Danny, taking special moments with, with each of the children, having a special dad-mum night or dad night or something where we let each child know, hey, you're very valuable, you're very highly cared for, you're very highly loved. Um, yeah, and while we do need to spend a lot of time with this child, we're still in here together. So it does, it is something that you need to initiate, something you need to actually do to make that happen. It's not going to happen by default. Thank you for your question. We appreciate your involvement as a, as a Zoomie. Good. Any other comments at all? We're right on four o'clock. We were heading for an hour, but uh, let's take a moment if there's one more question or comment. One up the back. Thank you. I was just going to ask and maybe make a comment. I mean, there's a few things when you get older and retire that um, sort of come up that you didn't even worry about before. I guess the first one that I noticed was 
I finished work on Friday. On a Monday, nobody rung me up. And the communication was like zero. Um, and then that was like a feeling of not valued anymore. Um, and that, to me, that took a while to get used to. Um, sometimes it takes a bit longer than, than you think. Um, the other thing you find as you get older that you can't do things that you used to do anymore. Um, I don't think of the Pathfinder stuff that we used to do, can't do that anymore. Um, and the same with your kids. You're, I mean, you've got family with your kids away over the other side of the world and so is some of ours. Um, and as you get older, you miss them more than you used to. Mm. And, uh, and sometimes that reacts in different ways, you know. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and go, you know, well, why can't I do something about that? Yes. Um, and you, you've got to go and do, I mean, sometimes I just pace up and down. Sometimes you've got to go outside, go for a walk, go up and down, or you find you get up in the morning and you do wash all the dishes, dry all the dishes, pack all the stuff away. Um, you know, yes. is, is, that, is that normal? <laughs> We've got to find something that, that is now missing. We had, a, we had something to, to do uh, when we're employed. I, I really appreciate you raising it. I remember talking to a, a lady whose husband was a financial guy in a major business. He was, shift, he was shifting millions of dollars in this business. He retired. And the next week, oh, I got $10. What, you know, he's dealing with $10, $50. And he was, his life, he's dealing with millions. And it, he said, I said, what was that like for you? And she said, it was hard work. Because now he's at home, he, he's vulnerable for depression, and, and he's hanging around home and telling her how to, how to do the shopping when she's done it for years. But he now has to, he has to have something to define who he is. And I sense what you're saying, Dave. In retirement years, and as a retired person, I've had to rebuild in some way my definition of myself apart from my work. We know that most men get their sense of identity from their work. You get a bunch of strangers, strange men together, what's the first question they ask? What do you do for a job? Mm. And we're defined by our work. And when we don't have that definition, I'm no longer working. We do need to redefine ourselves. So who, who am I now? So I really appreciate you raising the question. That can be a very significant time for depression, for anxiety. We know that one of the highest rates of suicide in men is the older age group. And I think for some of those reasons, they've lost who they are. Mm. And we all need a purpose. And so um, a good friend of mine who's in his 30s told me to take the best thing you can take into retirement is your health. You've got to have a project. So we have men sheds, and, you know, all those kind of things, and they're marvellous. And so I've got a car in the shed I'm building about and a neighbour down the road who needs a hand with some concreting and, and I'm teaching at the union having a ball. But if I didn't have those, mm. I, 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 yeah, I, what am I doing here? Mm. So I really appreciate your question. I think that's a vulnerable time for anxiety for those reasons. and so forth like you mentioned health factors social factors what is the research out there as well in connection with faith faith mm. and mental health like what what is the research sort of saying thank you and glad you raised it and uh sorry i had to make that obvious yeah, question well, hey you're the pastor <laughs> and we appreciate you <laughs> appreciate you, you you're raising it we talked a little bit about the, the, we mentioned spirituality as a passing area about faith or not so much faith, but our sense of well-being and who we're connected to. And that social connections are so incredibly significant. We're not designed to be alone. And in fact, the, the Christian textbook very early in its pages makes a reference to it's not good that, that people should be alone. It's, it's quite in the, in the scriptures. So when we think about faith, having uh, a belief outside of ourselves, of, of somebody stronger than ourselves, is, is, it can be very vital and key. And the hardwired to connect study that I mentioned to you, I only mentioned half of it. They said young people today are missing vital connections, but they said on two levels. They said on the horizontal level, they're missing connections with each other. But this, wasn't a, this was a mental health study. They said young people today are missing connections with what they call the divine, but they said in moral and spiritual meaning, which I found that fascinating. So they're missing connections with each other 
And there's a really neat on YouTube, uh, there's a, this guy does this really neat thing backed by imagery about put your phone down, shut your phone off and look up and walk around looking up rather than looking down those connections. But this hardwired to connect study highlighted that we're also missing, kids that are missing connections with moral and spiritual meaning. And, and I think, uh, Letitia, a faith system, uh, whatever that might be, can be a powerful a place for people to go when they feel vulnerable. In fact, they did this huge study a number of years ago. They studied 14,000 families across 24 different cultures. So it wasn't just in America, it wasn't Canada, it was 24 countries. And they were looking for the signs of a healthy family. And they came down, they discovered six key attributes of healthy families. And the first one was commitment, expressing love and affection numbers. But the last one was have some spiritual meaning. And they said whether they were Buddhists, Muslims, ever that, all of these healthy families focused on somebody outside of themselves. And it became a, a strength and again another anchor. Dan, in your experience in the counselling arena, would you care to comment and add something to that? Yeah, definitely. I think that people that have a faith system, it actually acts as a buffer for when they go through traumatising or grief-stricken events. When life gets hard and bruising, it's something about that faith paradigm that gives them the resilience to continue on in life, to cope and to endure. There's a social researcher and her name just escapes me, but she did all this research on how do people live a meaningful life. And she came, had these variables, as you'd expect, around social connections and having a meaningful vocation. And the last one was transcendent. So do you have an experience of the transcendent? Uh, for us as Christians, that's God. And so it's essential for our well-being, but it's also very, very useful in helping uh, protect us against some of the mental health potholes that we can trip into. It's interesting you use the word buffer there, Danny. I, it sparked me. There was, and I, again, I'm like, so I just can't think of the research person. But they did a study on, on um, you know, in their kind of faith, and they demonstrated that the rituals that, that faith communities do, such as prayer, hymn singing, uh, the study of, of a portion of scripture or some you know, meaningful passage of their, of their text, are actual, they've been shown to be buffers against mental illness. That was the actual phrase she used. Now, it doesn't mean that they won't get mental illness, but they act as buffers. So the rituals that you follow as a church community here have been shown to be actual buffers against mental which is pretty exciting. So we just think we're coming along to our church or wherever a community of, of faith and we're singing some hymns or whatever we do. We're just That's all we're doing. No, we're actually building buffers against mental illness. So that whole connection and ritual and patterns of connecting with the divine has a profound effect on our well-being. So it's pretty exciting. So thank you for the question. I like that as well because we've got we've got both, you know, in a church or in a in a community of faith, you've got the the vertical, but you've also got the horizontal. So yeah. you're getting them both at the same time. Yeah, which is powerful. Uh, that that connections with people is just vital. Thank you. One other yes, a comment up the back, and then we'll come to you. Thank you. I went here first, Tony. Thank you. Question from Tony. Yes, you, yes. You, you. She's she's let you go first. <laughs> Um, just getting back to anxiety, I believe anxiety and depression go hand in hand. Either one follows the other or the other way around, you know, because, I mean, I suffer with my, what I believe is both. When I have an anxiety, I can't think straight and can't make decisions and whatever. But then if depression sets in, uh, you, well, you can't sort of think straight, but you just sort of go into a lull, shut down, you know. But with anxiety, um, you know, you get all excited and you can't think straight, you can't make decisions and that sort of thing, you know. What do you think, what do you think about that? 